first of all, welcome to those that have joined. Um, welcome to this Obesity Institute present, uh, presents seminar session, which today we have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Emma Boyland from the University of Liverpool. And today's session is titled Food Marketing to Young People, Impacts on Diets and Implications for Policymakers. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm pleased you're controlling the slides because I have no technical ability whatsoever. <laughs> um, so just to note then that this session is being recorded. So dependent upon how shabby your Wi-Fi signals are, if you do drop off and drop back in, um, the session will be recorded to catch up uh, on anything that's perhaps missed afterwards. And next slide, please. And so just to start really is a big welcome from myself. So my name is George Sanders. I'm a senior research fellow in the mm -hmm. Carnegie School of Sport and also a co-theme lead within the weight management and well-being section of the Obesity Institute. And it's my job to hopefully not cause any mischief today and have a smooth um, sailing of the chairing of this session. And next slide, please. Answer questions today. You can ask questions through the Slido app. So if you go to www.slido.com and into the event hashtag LBU Obesity Institute, and if there is anything that kind of um, comes to mind as Emma's running through her slides that you think you'd like to ask at the end, please do share questions um, within Slido. And obviously, time permitting, we'll run through as many of those as possible um, at the end. And then next slide, and I will promptly hand over to Emma to introduce yourself and crack on with the session. Thanks very much. Thanks for the welcome and for having me today. Um, not uh, there in person, but um, online and hopefully um, that's more convenient for everyone and we can have a good um, discussion at the end. So, um, yes, I'm a professor of food marketing and child health at the University of Liverpool. Um, where I also lead the Appetite and Obesity Research Group. Um, and today I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of a number of aspects of um, my research um, on food marketing and sort of the knowledge translation elements of it as well, where we get to policy. Um, but just to start off with, I wanted to say, um, sort of, you might be thinking, why, why are we interested in food marketing and why children specifically? Um, and why is that generally the focus of this sort of research? Um, and I think, um, I mean, there's there's increasing awareness now that the global food system is dominated by essentially a handful of transnational food corporations that govern all sorts of things to do with the availability and accessibility and promotion of food. Um, and that has a really significant impact on our eating behaviour. So not just actual consumption, but um, choice patterns and norms and, and things like that. Um, and so it's important to understand how their actions in a commercial determinants of health sense um, affect those sorts of health relevant outcomes. And children are particularly relevant here because they are not only vulnerable to food marketing, as we all are, but they're particularly targeted as well. We know that, for example, um, very young children are unable to identify the difference between food marketing content and other content, so sort of entertainment content. Um, and that's increasingly difficult as things become more digital and blurred. Um, but also young people, even when they get to the stage where they understand the intent of marketing um, and that it's happening, they still, you know, think of teenagers, they're still vulnerable. They still have um, particularly poor impulse control. I don't know um, who remembers being a teenager, but it's not a time period of life where we're known for making kind of sensible long term health decisions, for example. Um, but children across the age ranges also tend to be avid users of the commercial media where you know food marketing um, is present. Um, and when new media kind of happens, like you know, digital and new digital platforms, it tends to be young people who pick those up and use them the most first. Um, but they're, as I say, they're particularly targeted by food marketing because not only are young people able to influence the spending of the family, so there's the classic sort of evidence that if a parent goes food shopping with a child, they'll spend um, $10 more than if they go on their own. And there'll be an influence over, you know, children will make requests for specific brands and specific products and they'll go in the trolley instead of alternative things. Um, so they're influencing that family spending at that point. 
Young people also have pocket money to spend and they don't have to spend it on boring things like gas and electricity bills. Um, they can spend on things like confectionery and snacks that are much more pleasing for them to buy. Um, and then they'll grow up as well and become adult consumers of the future who will make purchasing decisions, not just for themselves, but potentially for a family as well. And so by food marketing and brands, being able to capture them and get their brand loyalty when they're young, um, that sort of sets the foundation for a lifetime of, of sales, which is obviously profitable for that brand. Um, and we need to be concerned about children because um, of all of those vulnerabilities and because, I mean, in the UK and in every country worldwide, apart from the US, who have ratified the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, there are numerous rights in there that are affected by food marketing. Um, the right to the highest attainable standard of health is one, but particularly um, with the digital world, there are a number of other rights that are affected as well. So children should have the right to access information such as available online without the um, implicit harms being present as well. Um, and they have a right to privacy, which is threatened by the kind of um, data collection that underpins digital marketing that I'm going to talk about. Um, so there's a reason to focus on ensuring those rights are protected. And these are some of the phrasings that I'm going to use um, throughout the presentation. So just to make sure um, it's clear what I'm talking about in terms of um, food marketing, the impact of food marketing on our behaviour is said to be a function of both exposure and power. And this is set out in this WHO framework from 2012. Um, essentially, exposure is the reach and frequency of the marketing message. So how many people see the marketing um, and also what it's for in terms of the healthiness of the product or brand identified. Um, and also the uh, power of a message is the creative content of that message. So what are the themes and the imagery and the messaging that the brand is using to be persuasive and convince us that this is a, a product that we need to be purchasing and consuming? And so both of those two things together are important and are what determine whether and to what extent marketing impacts our behaviour. Um, and WHO have always kind of taken a, a lead on, on setting out the Company, countries, excuse me, need to do more to take action on food marketing, um, specifically calling on governments to um, monitor and bring in regulations to restrict these things, particularly where they're affecting children. Um, and generally, um, there's a lot of evidence from sort of Western countries. So you, the UK, um, but also um, the US and Canada um, and increasingly Australia as well tend to have a lot of evidence around this sort of stuff. There tends to be less evidence in the um, lower middle income countries um, and then they, they can struggle then to um, you know, provide the evidence base for policy action. But I'm going to touch on what we've been doing to support that a little bit later on. Um, but some of these actions around understanding how much food marketing there is are very much easier if you're just talking about TV. When you start to get into the digital media, then it gets even more challenging methodologically to understand I'm going to pick up on that as well. Um, so I'm going to try to cover very quickly because there's not enough time to do any of them in any detail, really, but cover all of those aspects. So exposure, power and impact. What does the evidence say about those things? But also some of the kind of critical um, issues in terms of regulating food marketing is, um, you know, to what extent can we ever demonstrate a causal relationship with obesity um, and what should policymakers actually be doing to effectively restrict um, and healthy food marketing for children. So if we take exposure first. Um, we all understand that food marketing exists in all the traditional places. We know it's on TV. We know it's, you know, if you go to the cinema, there'll be ads at the beginning. When you're, you know, out in the outdoor streetscape, there'll be ads on billboards and on the sides of buildings and so on. Um, but ads are increasingly everywhere. And when we talk about digital media, it's not really any one thing. Um, marketing and digital media can be a number of different types of things and they each differ in terms of the way they're delivered to individuals and the way they're experienced by individuals and it changes very rapidly as well so um, probably about 15 years ago there were lots of studies coming out looking at things like food brand websites so going to the website for mars or, or cadbury's or wherever and having a look at what the marketing was like on there to you know to what extent was that material um, enticing children to come in and kind of get interested in the brand um, and in some cases that was using advert games so just simple online games easy enough for a kid to play um, but would have brand presence throughout the game so we were going from a 30 second tv advert where it's a very discreet segment of, of advertising um, and it would only last about 30 seconds or perhaps a minute 
to kids playing these games that could potentially you know play them for hours um and they would always be just challenging enough to get kids kind of trying to beat their previous score and it would always suggest that they invited friends in as well to beat their score on the leaderboard or whatever and sort of like generate that additional exposure through a social network but now that kind of thing is done in a more sophisticated way of course because we have social media we have those networks set up already and brand messages can propagate very quickly through those networks um, and also through things like you know food delivery apps um, but increasingly we're seeing it um, appearing in kind of immersive um, contexts as well so when people are playing games um, the brand will not advertise as a discrete advertisement as such but it will be built into the gameplay so that the character in the game will walk past a um, you know a food outlet will, that will have availability of, of fast food or whatever or perhaps a, a drinks um, machine and they'll be very strongly branded um, and so that's an area that things are moving towards um, as the digital media element develops but back in the day when it was relatively straightforward and we could just look at tv and say what's the advertising like on the channels that kids watch um, i was part of this um, international collaborative study with 13 different research groups across 22 countries um, and this was recording uh, TV channels watched by children, popular with children, and sort of coding the food advertising that was shown for whether it was unhealthy foods, healthy foods, or um, sort of miscellaneous products like uh, vitamins and tea and coffee and stuff like that. Um, and if you look at the um, the graph there, you can see that no country had less than 50% of its adverts showing unhealthy foods. So that's the dark black bar. Um, so always 50 percent. So at least half of the ads on TV were um, promoting unhealthy items. And in some cases that went up to close to 90 percent, uh, which is quite a stark contrast with, you know, the nutrition education we're giving children and saying that this is what constitutes a diet. And um, the message that they're getting from TV is this is the sort of stuff it's normal to eat. And that's things like fast food, chocolate, confectionery, sugary breakfast cereals and soft drinks and so on. Um, when you look in other spaces, so we've done some work around bus shelters um, and this was in a deprived area of northern England. We had data on the exact location of all of the bus shelters that carried advertising and we were able to look at all of those and say what advertising is on them. And you see they're close to half of them were for foods and beverages, including alcohol, um, and around a third of them would be considered unsuitable or you know, not permitted to be advertised to children on TV under current UK guidance. Um, even more so if you follow the World Health Organization rules on what's permitted and not permitted, they're very strict, more strict than the UK model, um, because um, at least the previous WHO Euro one was, they, they've updated it recently, um, but they do not allow sweeteners, um, they count uh, McDonald's fries as unhealthy, whereas the UK model doesn't, um, and also the chicken burger as well, so if you use the WHO model they're saying, you know, four out of five ads shouldn't be shown there because children will see them. Um, but you know, majority of the ads uh, promoted McDonald's um, and they also do that with um, power techniques that are appealing to children. Um, but in this study, we didn't see any difference um, across the deciles of deprivation, but that was largely, I think, because a lot of the, um, the bus shelters were in deprived um, locations. Um, and so there just wasn't enough variation to see, um, see that difference. But when we did this study in Liverpool, this um, was my colleague Mark Green cycling around Liverpool with a GoPro camera on his backpack um, and recording the full streetscape from which then we could isolate the marketing exposure and look at what it was for. Um, you can see that the food ads are in um, green on the map on the left, but they're in yellow on the, the graph. Um, and you can see that them mapped out by the deciles of um, deprivation as well, such that there were a greater proportion of food ads in the more deprived areas um, and that's quite a consistent theme is that um, uh, even with regional variation in TV um, but mostly because of screen time um, young people in deprived neighbourhoods see more um, food advertising because they use screens more and because their physical environment tends to hold more food advertising and therefore more unhealthy food advertising. Um, we also know that food advertising is seeping into everything, including sports as well. So um, not just at the professional level, where you'll often see um, professional teams sponsored by particular food brands, um, but also at the sort of community level and amateur levels as well, where food brands will often sponsor either um, competitions or you know 
provide sporting equipment that then is heavily branded. Um, so they're ensuring that they're, they're becoming associated with um, that particular sport. Um, and they're doing that in the digital arena as well so um, brands like Red Bull have been very successful in um, targeting the kind of adrenaline sports market and they sponsor a number of different things like alpine racing and, and all different um, more kind of adrenaline sports but um, other brands are trying to um, you know pick up on that success and use that same strategy as well and are targeting gamers and esports competitions which are increasingly getting you know, millions and millions of people engaged. Um, and so those brands, you know, particularly uh, energy drinks and, and snacks are kind of front and centre and ensuring their exposure to that market as well. We looked at this in terms of sports um, by looking at the FIFA um, World Cup in 2018, the Men's World Cup. And we recorded the um, quarterfinals, the semifinals and both versions of the final because it was broadcast on both um, BBC and ITV. Um, and we looked through those recordings to code the um, presence of brands. So we're looking not just at food in this instance, but alcohol and gambling as well, and tobacco, although you know, we didn't find any tobacco, thankfully. Um, but what we did find across that almost 28 hours of footage is that there were almost 1,800 unhealthy brand marketing references. Um, and 74.8 of those were for food or beverage brands, mostly on the border around the pitch, so it'd be visible um, at any time for somebody watching that game, of which there were millions of children. Um, and these five brands at the bottom, um, four brands, sorry, were, were very dominant. Um, so it's McDonald's, Coca-Cola, uh, Meng Nui, which is a, a Chinese dairy and ice cream producer, um, and Powerade as well. And they were very visible. Um, around the sides of pictures, embossed onto the pitch at the beginning, on the um, boards behind the manager when they're being interviewed at the end of the game and things like that. Um, so the presence was really littered throughout um, and any child watching the World Cup um, for the sporting footage would also have had significant and healthy food brand exposure as well. Um, I mentioned that it's moving into this kind of gaming sphere um, and we've started to look at those spaces as well to see what the exposure to food marketing is like there. Um, and a research group in um, the US looked at the game stream platform Twitch um, over the course of 18 months and found there's a massive increase in brand exposure um, and an increasing dominance of those sorts of brands that I mentioned. So things like sugary beverages, but also delivery services. So they're very much selling the message that a gamer can sustain their gaming activity and get enough kind of energy to augment their gaming performance by getting deliveries of things like sugary beverages direct to them and um, to consume snacks in an easy way while they're gaming and so on. Um, and we've also more recently, as a paper that's under review here on the right hand side, looked at Twitch. Um, but not in the kind of structural bits of the site, which is what the US study did, but actually within the game streams themselves. So I don't know if people are familiar with what this sort of site looks like, but essentially you're watching a, a game streamer um, who is the guy there in pink hair um, or blue hair on the little cutout bit. Um, that's Ninja, who's one of the most popular um, streamers. So he's playing the game and you can see his his immediate physical environment, which includes a um, Red Bull fridge, um, and that's not an accident. He is sponsored by Red Bull, so that fridge will be visible behind him for the entire time he's playing that game and people are watching. Um, but then on the game stream itself, um, you can see the main kind of gameplay. And then to the right hand side, there's an ad for Uber Eats um, that could stay fixed in place for the entire time as well, or it could rotate through a few different brands. And brands can also advertise at the bottom that bit with circled in yellow. And um, they will often kind of promote competitions and, and put links in there for you to go through to additional content. Um, and the majority of those ads are for those sorts of product categories that tend to be less healthy. Thinking now to the, the power um, issue of kind of creative content and some persuasion. Um, when studies have looked at this across the board, um, and this review here on the left is one, um, they've tended to find um, differences in how marketing um, is created when it's trying to appeal to children versus adults. Um, so for adults, it can be a lot about kind of the, the cost value, um, the, the fact that everybody is going to enjoy it, it's good for families and so on. Um, but when they're advertising to children, often it's about things like premium offers so that they will get a toy with the food, for example, um, 
or um, increasingly now it's things like a, a download for a digital device or something like that. So it's something that's provided with the food to get the child to want that and then have to get the food to get it. Um, there's also a lot of um, emphasis on promotional characters as well. Um, so either people like um, Tony the Tiger, who's a brand character created by Kellogg's and only used to promote um, Kellogg's Frosties and he has no kind of identity beyond that. Um, or licensed characters. So those are characters that appear in films. So um, things like um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to use a dated reference um, or, you know, Marvel characters, whatever. And then they then um, feature in the, the advertising to make people who have affinity to those characters then come to the food as well. But um, they will also emphasise taste. Um, you don't often see a food ad say something like this is going to taste all right. You might like it. It's generally you know, super overhyped. So it's kind of like this is going to be a taste sensation, a taste explosion. Effectively, it's going to be the nicest thing you've ever tasted in your life. Um, and to kids, there's really the strong element of fun as well. So either the packaging or the kind of the way you consume the product is a bit fun, like it's a, a new lollipop with a fun dispenser thing, um, or that it just is generally the brand is fun. And look here, here here's all this kind of like fun and fantasy content in the ad to really grab their attention and hold it um, to the ad so that they can be persuaded. Um, and a recent study I was part of um, with the UNICEF team in the Philippines was looking at digital marketing to young people by the big brands. And you can see that 72% of marketing um, appealed to children and 84% appealed to adolescents by using those sorts of themes um, that can vary um, by age group. So for adolescents, often it's more focused on kind of social connection and popularity and things as, as people are, are making their way in, in the world and are concerned about kind of peer acceptance and things like that. And um, whereas for younger children, as I said, it's often kind of fun and fantasy based. Um, but it can be quite disingenuous as well. So it can be a lot of it around suggesting that if you consume those sorts of foods, it's really going to make you well connected with either your peers or with your family. And it's about love and kind of special emotions and stuff. So it's particularly appealing to um, emotional drives um, and not necessarily kind of practical considerations around food and, and healthy diets. Um, and around the time particularly um, that the UK they were considering increasing restrictions on um, food marketing and we're talking about including some of these kind of power elements in those restrictions. Um, we noticed a bit of a trend towards increasing reference to physical activity in advertising. So the narrative by the food industry at this time was very much that um, the reason that we have this issue with obesity is because of sedentariness and um, lack of exercise. It's nothing to do with what we eat. And of course, um, you know, we all know physical activity is hugely important for, for healthy weight. Um, but they, you know, there's there's no denying that the diet that we're consuming is also part of that problem. Um, and that was very much being denied by the food industry. Um, and it was noted that in advertising, often they would try to create a kind of health halo around the product. So, for example, um, you can see there on the left hand side that the cocoa pops would be advertised with um, fruit next to it. So it's usually that kind of breakfast cereal on the family table but it's sugary breakfast cereal and then there's a fruit bowl and there's some you know nice milk or water around it um to uh, make it look really like a, a healthy setting in general so that you can kind of overlook the fact that the, the product being promoted is unhealthy um, and also we saw that lots more advertising was using themes around physical activity so the coca-cola one was saying move more and eat well um, and uh, McDonald's, it was a little farmer's campaign there on the right, where it would show kids kind of running around in a, in a garden um, for a few minutes, um, as if that level of activity is going to really sort of counteract the kinds of diets that they're promoting, where kids will be eating a happy meal. Um, I think they need to get on a treadmill for a bit longer than that, for that really to be a valid uh, argument. Um, and we've done a bit of research on this kind of issue of uh, I guess the, the messaging in advertising and how it's perceived. Um, so as I say, taste is very much strongly emphasised and so is the emotional connection between you and other people as you consume those foods. So think now about the adverts for things like KFC bargain buckets where it will show a family or a group of friends enjoying that food at the same time 
or um, ads and promotional stuff around kind of major sporting events where it will show everybody tucking into a pizza and they kind of pull that slice of pizza away and the cheese, you know, stretches and all that kind of stuff. Um, and when we've looked at um, studies that have exposed people to food marketing when they're in an fMRI scanner and compared that to their brain reactions when they're seeing other marketing or no marketing at all, we see there's consistent active activity in areas to do with sensory motor response. So this idea that we would kind of reach for something, we're motivated to acquire food, which makes sense. And also, um, you know, visual activity and attention makes sense as well, because we're looking at something that's usually brightly coloured. But also areas of the brain that are activated are those to do with um, taste perception and emotional processing, which is hugely relevant to what we're talking about, because it's actually interfering with our, our sense of taste, this idea that it's saying it's going to be a taste sensation. It's actually enhancing our kind of expectations of what products are going to taste like. Um, and there are studies that show kids think branded foods taste better than a non-branded food, even when they're actually identical and it's just the packaging that's been changed. So it's kind of suggests that it's interfering with our, our taste perception in that sense. And also it's very much hitting us at an emotional level rather than a kind of practical reasoned decision um, and so uh, it's can be said for children particularly to be manipulative because of that emotional linkage. When we get into digital marketing it becomes even more complicated so you know digital marketing is promotional activity that's delivered through a digital medium um, but it's set us apart from all those other forms that we've talked about like outdoor or billboards and TV, because it uses these creative methods like those adverts do, but bases them on the digital data that has been acquired from us as we spend time online. So um, we all know that, you know, that we have this digital footprint that's being collected anytime we go anywhere. And you see that sometimes when you've kind of searched for a particular product and then that product is advertised heavily to you on a social media site. Um, but the estimation is that children, um, by the age of 12, brands have around 12 million data points on children. And that's a, probably a huge underestimation because that data didn't include signed in environments where they have an account that may or may not use um, a fake date of birth in order to access platforms designed for older kids, for example. Um, so there's a huge amount of data being collected in the backdrop to determine what creative methods are going to work best and when that adds should be delivered to an individual in order to best get them you know most make them most likely to respond and, and purchase the item and um, in the background it all works a bit like this so the user will interact in some way with a website or an app um, that has some marketing space on it that needs to be filled um, the request is then sent to gather data on who you are so essentially you know um, are you sitting in the demographic that they're interested in, whether that be a kind of a new parent or a teen or an older adult or whatever? Um, and what sorts of sites do you normally go to? What sorts of things do you normally click on and buy? Um, and then the uh, platforms behind the scenes will receive that information. And then the advertisers have to essentially uh, bargain to try to get the right to access that spot and give you one of their ads. So they're kind of saying, like, how much do I want to pay? to place my ad in this spot to get at this particular individual or these you know, various individuals. Um, and the, you know, it goes to the highest bidder then. So they want to maximise the, the, the platform, wants to maximise the amount of money it gets for that uh, particular ad. So it goes to the highest bidder who really wants your attention the most and is willing to pay for it. And then the ad is placed and you will see as you scroll through the, the site that you're on. And it, of course, all happens in kind of milliseconds behind the scenes so that you as a user will not notice. And it will just seem like a kind of seamless, um, you know, like it's always been there. Um, but that ad will have been purchased. Called, and it's a programmatic ad delivery. So it's all done kind of um, digitally behind the scenes. And the challenge with trying to understand how much marketing there is therefore in the digital space uh, it's quite complicated because when I, you know, with TV, we can just go to those channels that we know kids watch. But then when I go online and look at social media, what appears is marketing tailored to me, not the same as what kids will see when they go on their digital devices. Um, the data does exist, of course, on how much marketing there is and where it's going and who's interacting with it. But it's all held by the big companies like Meta and Amazon um, and Google. 
and they don't readily let it go, particularly not to people who um, they think are going to criticise their uh, business model by talking about how harmful it is. So they don't tend to share with public health researchers. So we've had to find alternative ways to um, measure and quantify how much food marketing there is um, in digital spaces. And we've done that in a few different ways, um, both using kind of technological options like recording screens and developing um, automatic uh, machine learning tools that can then scan that footage and identify brand images, um, but also kind of more um, traditional researcher led monitoring methods. So ways of looking at, for example, the YouTube channel of someone like Coca-Cola and kind of evaluating how much marketing they put out, how often on that channel um, and the kind of persuasive techniques they're using in that marketing, because it's going to be similar stuff then that is propagated throughout the Internet because they will have a, a strategy um, and they'll use that in every way to reach people that they can. And we've applied those sorts of tools in a number of different places online. I mentioned the Philippine study earlier, but we've done studies of exposure and power um, across Europe and also um, South America and um, the uh, Asia Pacific as well, and starting to build a much bigger body of evidence to demonstrate the, the levels of uh, marketing online and how much of it is for food and just how um, uniquely persuasive it is because of the, the affordances of digital tech and what it can do and, and how visually appealing it can, it can look. Um, Moving on to impact then, so in terms of what we know about the impact of food marketing on behaviour, um, the evidence essentially maps itself onto um, a model like this. We created this based on the evidence. So the evidence suggests that if you have exposure to marketing there in the top left hand corner, um, it does things like increases our awareness of brands and increases our positive attitudes towards products and also unhealthy foods in general. We then are exposed again to those brands at the point of sale. So whether that's in a fast food outlet or online shopping or wherever, or actually physically in a store, um, we're exposed to that again. Um, and then we can either purchase it or in the case of children request that it's purchased um, for us. Um, if we purchase a product, we're likely to consume it. And then there are various steps there to say, you know, does that contribute to a sustained excess energy intake that would over time lead to weight gain? So there's this sort of model. We're not really suggesting it works in such a neat stepwise fashion every single time, um, but the evidence supports the fact that it's it has all of these influences um, and therefore has a kind of logical link between marketing exposure and weight gain um, that we'll come back to. When we've tested, um, focusing just on, on intake now, really, rather than some of those earlier outcomes, but we've tested this using a number of different marketing forms. So there was a study that looked at the front of cereal packs. So um, how much cereal is depicted on the front of the box? Um, and you know, you'll notice that if you've ever had those little kind of individual packs of 30 grams and then put one in a bowl, it looks like there's not very much in there relative to what they show. On, on the front of boxes, it's always bursting out of the bowl. There's always a really kind of hearty portion of cereal. Um, and it was noted that this might, you know, might be an issue because especially for children, it's suggesting they should be consuming at that level. Um, we mocked up some cereal boxes, as you can see on the right hand side there, not the um, the world's greatest uh, uh, Photoshop effort, but um, it was for children in schools and it looked plausible enough in, in person, I can promise you. Um, so uh, the box on the left was a you know, depicted a recommended serving size. The box on the right depicted what's more typical of cereal box um, covers where it's kind of coming out of the bowl. And that was actually 90 grams of cereal to get it to look that full. Um, we then randomised children in breakfast clubs to receive one or other of those boxes and gave them milk and, you know, facility to serve themselves the cereal. Uh, and those kids that were given the box with the bigger portion on the front served themselves significantly more and consumed significantly more as well. Um, suggesting that this is actually a sort of marketing cue that is affecting children in the sense that they're you know, using that as a potentially as a, as a cue for what's normal behaviour in a sort of social modelling type way. Um, we've also looked at the influence of celebrity endorsers as one element of the kind of persuasive power of marketing. Um, so I did a study years ago on Gary Lineker, who, um, as we know, was a former um, England footballer, but also um, presents match of the day and is in the marketing uh, as an endorser for uh, Walker's Crisps. 
Um, we randomised children in schools to see either a Walker's advert featuring Gary Lineker as the endorser um, or a segment of Match of the Day um, in which Gary Lineker were featured, um, another food advert that had nothing to do with crisps or Gary Lineker, or a toy advert, so an advert that was in, of interest to children but was nothing to do with food. Um, children were then given two bowls of crisps, one was labelled Walker's and one was labelled supermarket brand and they had um, an amount of time to consume as much as they wanted. Um, the consumption of Walker's crisps is shown there in the lighter blue bars on the figure. So you can see that um, in every condition kids ate more of the Walker's crisps than the other brand, which is not too surprising. There's a kind of premium brand um, interpretation there. Um, but the kids who saw Gary Ninica, I either in the Walker's Crisps advert or in the Match of the Day video, consume proportionally more, um, well, they consumed more Walker's Crisps overall um, and didn't reduce their intake of the other um, supermarket brand either, such that their calorie consumption overall was, was greater. Um, and so it suggests that his endorsement works, even when he's not in a specific endorsement context when he was just presenting Match of the Day. Um, uh, and that in, its in itself worked as a sort of advertisement for the brand. Um, which is really what brands are hoping for when they bring a celebrity endorser on board. They're hoping that the renown and the high visibility of that celebrity will effectively act as an advertisement um, as they go about whatever their other business is that they're a celebrity for. Um, so that seemed to work very well um, as far as that experiment shows. The new form of celebrities are sort of online influencers. Um, we saw one before for the game stream footage, but there's a lot more present on social media as well. Um, putting out videos about all sorts of kind of interests and leisure pursuits and toiletries and makeup and so on. Um, and we were interested to see what effect their endorsement of foods had on young people who are, you know, avid users of this uh, and viewers of these sorts of uh, this sort of content. Um, and Zoella here um, for our study was one of the most popular influencers with young people at the time we did the study. Um, and so again, we randomised children in schools to see um, this kind of left hand side mocked up banner of her profile page um, featuring her holding either unhealthy products as shown here or healthy products. So we had to um, edit in things like her holding a banana and a piece of fruit um, or non-food products. So her holding things like an iPhone or a pair of shoes um, and children were then given healthy and unhealthy snacks to consume. And what we found was kids who saw the unhealthy um, food images like here um, consumed a significantly greater amount of unhealthy snacks and therefore consumed significantly more overall. Um, but seeing the influencer with a healthy item didn't promote healthy food intake. Um, and so therefore it's not um, based on this evidence, the, the kind of solution just to get everybody to, to uh, represent healthy foods and then we'll have no trouble with children and their fruits and vegetables. Um, we've also done some assessment of that game streaming content as well. So the study on the left is UK based. Where we asked children to recall the food marketing that they've seen in these digital game streams. And then we asked them about their food behaviours as well. And there was a significant um, indirect association between their level of recall of food marketing and their purchase um, and also their consumption in the other model of unhealthy foods. And that's mediated by unhealthy food attitudes. So that's one of those earlier outcomes in that kind of stepwise model. So it's kind of making people, or not, it's not causal, it's associated with um, more positive attitudes towards unhealthy foods. Um, and then there's um, this outcome that is associated with greater purchase and consumption of those foods as well. Um, and the study on the right hand side was with adults who use um, game stream platforms, both Twitch and the YouTube platform as well. Um, and they were asked about how often um, they felt cravings after viewing an advertisement on the platform. And a significant number of people um, actively craved the thing that they'd seen. And around 8% reported on average purchasing a product based on viewing the advertisement, um, which might seem a small percentage. But if you think that there are kind of millions and millions of viewers at any one time, um, that's probably quite a big um, monetary investment for the brand or return on investment. Um, and when we've been able to synthesise the evidence for studies that have kind of experimentally manipulated food marketing and measured intake as an outcome, um, this was from a few years ago now, but um, combining all of the studies on adults for the top bit um, found no significant overall effect on immediate intake in adults. 
Um, but in children's studies with children at the bottom there, um, children's food intake did significantly increase after exposure to food ads compared to non-food ads. We repeated this um, for the WHO to underpin the new global guidelines that were released this year. Um, so um, more recently, of course, there are more studies than in that last meta-analysis. And, and we were able to look at intake and those significant positive um, impacts such that children's food intake was increasing after food marketing compared to non-food marketing. But also so was their choice that are more likely to choose the advertised item or unhealthy items in general. Um, and they're also more likely to show greater preference for the brand or the product or say it tasted better as they're showing a taste preference. Um, so the evidence um, when synthesised is quite clear in terms of direction. Um, looking at effects uh, or relationships with obesity, again, we've done some sort of um, structural equation modelling to look at the relationships in that, in that hierarchy of effects model. Um, and this was for TV advertising, but we found a number of direct effects. I won't go into all of them because of the timing, but um, commercial TV time in children specifically, and this was in 2,500 children in the UK, um, the amount of time they spent watching commercial TV was significantly positively associated with purchase um, of foods, which was then associated with the BMI Z score as well, adjusted for age and gender. It was also associated with consumption directly and consumption via their requests to parents, as we discussed before. Um, and these effects were either not found or were significantly weaker for non-commercial TV. And of course, there's a bit of overlap there because kids who watch more TV in general tend to watch more commercial and non-commercial TV. Um, but essentially, the, the effects supported it for um, commercial TV to a much greater extent and that there was this link with their BMI Z score. We also looked at this issue of compensation. So if it's going to contribute to obesity, Food marketing would have to lead to intake that's not compensated for, um, such that it would be kind of excess energy taken in over time. Um, um, we did a study looking at that. And so children's snack intake was measured. We then measured their lunch intake as well after they'd seen food marketing and non-food marketing. And children didn't reduce their lunch intake if they'd eaten more of the snack. So um, their overall calorie intake on days when they'd seen the food marketing was significantly greater than on days when they hadn't. So again, this supports the idea that it's kind of a plausible connection with obesity. And we can't do a randomised control trial where we restrict um, young people's exposure to food marketing in one group and kind of lock them away for 10 years and see what happens to their BMI compared to kids who are seeing lots of marketing. So one way to get at this is to look at the um, Bradford Hill criteria to see it, does it meet the criteria that there would be a causal relationship between food marketing and obesity. Um, and again, I won't go through all of them, but just to say, you know, based on the strength of evidence and the consistency of it across different research um, populations and different time and different stimuli and so on, and the plausible coherence of it, um, actually it does meet those criteria to suggest that it's, um, you know, a a feasible thing and a reasonable thing to say based on the evidence that food marketing contributes to obesity, which means that we should take preventative action and regulate it effectively. Um, the UK does have regulations around what can be marketed to children on TV. And when they were brought in, the amount of food advertising on children's dedicated channels reduced by about half, which is kind of doing what it says on the tin for the policy. But um, Advertising on all other types of channels, so sports and music and family in this instance, all increased um, to the extent that those increases together were bigger than the drop we'd had in children's TV. Um, and so essentially the marketing migrated to those other spaces. And those other spaces are actually where children spend more of their viewing time than they do in dedicated children's programming. So um, it was you know, it was attempting to restrict marketing directed to children, but actually just put it in places where they're more likely to see it, which is a slightly unfortunate outcome. Um, and so we had to do a bit more work to demonstrate that kids don't spend all their time watching kind of child focused TV. They watch a lot of family programming like Britain's Got Talent and um, I'm a Celebrity and all those sorts of things. Um, and that's where the marketing sits now. Um, and that actually is an extensive amount of marketing in that period for unhealthy foods, food delivery and all the sorts of things um, that's been mentioned. 
But if we were to bring in a 9 p.m. watershed that would capture those time periods for those big family shows, um, modelling based on what we know about marketing and intake suggests that it could reduce um, childhood obesity by around 4.6 percent and overweight as well. Um, and to do this in a way that's more beneficial to um, the more deprived households as well, who have greater screen time and therefore, um, you know, a policy like this could actually um, do something to improve health inequalities. Um, we also have reviewed all of the um, existing and implemented policies to restrict food marketing worldwide and found that if done well, um, they can effectively reduce exposure and power and purchasing of unhealthy foods. Um, but there's limited effect um, or limited evidence to show there's an effect directly on diet because that's a very difficult thing to pick up and to attribute specifically to a change in policy and not any other secular trend that may be happening. But essentially that if, if governments want to regulate, it can be done effectively um, and there are precedents for that. Um, and we also looked at what type of policy so that we could better advise on what government should be doing or what the kind of ideal policy should be. Um, I don't know if you've seen a harvest plot before, but essentially the each square, blue square is a study and the dark blue ones are the higher quality studies. Um, and we have the various outcomes we were looking at down the left hand side and the um, options of how effective the policy was along the top. Um, and if you look at any policy compared to no policy, it's a bit of a mixed bag. You could look at that and think maybe it's not worth having a policy because it could. So many of them are ineffective um, and it's um, not at all clear that if you bring in a policy, it's going to have this beneficial effect we're looking for. But when you break the policies down by what's mandatory and government led, and what's voluntary led by industry, there's quite a stark difference. So that self-regulation by industry very much does not appear to work. Um, and if it's a mandatory policy led by a government with an appropriate nutrient profile model and so on, it's much more likely to be effective in um, achieving meaningful change in those key indicators like exposure and power. So um, just to sum up then, food marketing is everywhere. Um, is there's robust evidence that affects food intake and um, various measures It's likely um, has this causal relationship with obesity. Um, so we need policies, um, but we need them to cover digital as well. Um, and we hope that the UK will do that in 2025. But uh, watch this space. We'll have to see. Um, I'll stop there if I'm aware of time. But thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. I know that all sounds deliciously complicated, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, there are a few questions um, that have come through on Slido, so we'll we'll read through um, a few of those ones. The first one that came in was from Lena. So I'm currently in Zambia and I'm amazed at the level of food marketing targeted at kids on billboards, etc. Have you had any specific links to any child targeted food marketing research in low to middle income countries? A little bit, yeah. There is some work going on in some African nations at the moment with um, online um, advertising. Certainly, I know there's a study about to come out in Kenya done by UNICEF. So UNICEF are quite active at, in looking at this now. It's one of their priorities. Um, as I say, we're developing all of those tools as well. And um, some of them are really low resource to allow kind of health ministries or people, you know, low resources to conduct monitoring studies to, to really make the case that they have this problem. So there's not enough research for sure in some of those spaces, but it is increasing. Um, and um, yeah, I'm always up for helping people to um, gather that evidence um, if any support is needed. Fantastic. So next question was around what will be needed for national and international policy buy-in to enable restrictions given the lucrative nature of unhealthy food and brand marketing? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's the challenge and we've seen it here in the UK. So the government kind of proposed that they would bring in this new legislation um, to restrict food marketing. So have this 9 p.m. watershed for TV and restrict paid for advertising online. Um, and they kind of committed to it, it's written into legislation, but then it's been delayed and delayed again because the industry have made the case that, you know, there are gaps in the evidence and they need time to get ready and also, you know, they, they have a number of different very plausible and very loud arguments that they make to push back. And it's very difficult um, 
whether it's a government deciding to do this or a school who, you know, McDonald's say, we'll buy you all of this lovely sporting equipment. We just want to have our brand all over it. And at the time, you know, the economic considerations are very important, obviously. So everyone's, you know, got to make ends meet and so on. Um, but I think that it's, it's short sighted not for a government not to take action when we look at the cost of obesity. Um, clearly, something has to change in our relationship with food. Um, and also the evidence that we've seen so far is that um, it actually doesn't necessarily cost money. Um, so, for example, when the TV regulations change, the argument was going to be there will be no more original programming for children. It's going to ruin the children's channels and so on. But the marketing money just came from somewhere else instead of from unhealthy foods, you know. Um, and when asked about the impact of um, any other food marketing restrictions on um, economic outcomes, um, companies weren't able to say that there was any. So it's, it's not, we can't disentangle it from any other changes over time. So it's certainly not the case that it suddenly means, you know, uh, economics falls off a cliff or whatever. So, um, yeah, it does take buy and it takes political will. And it can be a tough ask um, and there will always be massive industry pushback. Um, but it's a case of kind of sticking to the evidence, I think, and the preventative message. OK, fantastic. So the next question kind of revolves around and I picked up on this on your last slide. It was around the immersive environments. So is that mm. things such as like virtual reality? And the question here is, could immersive environments um, such as VR act as a further method moving forwards for even further unhealthy food marketing and brand advertisements yes and it almost certainly will and in some extent it's already there um so coca-cola launched i don't know if you remember coca-cola bite that came out last year with a kind of computerized image on the can that was launched in the metaverse before it was physically available in shops um and this is increasingly happening so you know brands are anticipating that we're all going to be in this immersive virtual world next um, and so they're already very much there and if anything it's more dangerous than the advertising we have now um, in the sense that it, if it's built into that environment um, it's that much more um, yeah immersed children are less likely to recognize it and um, it's sort of got that unconscious influence on us then and it could be ever present as well as I say compare that to a 30 second tv ad that's on and it's impactful it's repetitive but it's on and then it's gone Whereas an immersive world, it could be in your eye line for the entire time you're there. And then just finally, there was a question, another question around these immersive environments. And there's one here. I wonder if there's scope for immersive environments to be adopted to run virtual reality health education programs and even healthy cooking classes. I don't know, has there been much research out there around that or is it kind of still coming to the fore? I think it's still developing. There's been some research around um, things like uh, clinical communication. So I know that you can already train health professionals through things like immersive environments. So you can have kind of a virtual patient who actually exhibits symptoms and they can be assessed and you can train people to interact in certain ways. So it certainly is going to be a possibility. Um, I think things like education don't by themselves counteract the massive and powerful messaging coming from the food industry. So it's important to regulate and remove that um, alongside giving people education and good nutrition, of course. Um, but yeah, certainly those possibilities are there. And in terms of research scope, there's a lot of work now in terms of how you can kind of get people so you can do things like have taste tests while they're in an immersive world, you know, so they reach out for a product so that they can see um, and actually then interact it and real life in the lab and consume it sort of thing so it's like an augmented reality thing so there's a lot of potential there for researchers as well and I think there will be lots of implications for food-based research as well as policy on this yeah okay fantastic well I think that's all of the questions that have popped through would you mind just sharing your screen again just for the last few slides I think there's a few more at the end sorry just, yeah um... a few finishing off Fantastic. So if we're just next slide, please. And then this is just a reminder for, for people that we do have our Masters in Obesity course and we've got our postgraduate open day this evening at Headingley and City Campuses. If anybody is around and wants to come and learn a bit more about that course, what it entails and perhaps the opportunities um, that the course um, could lead to. And then next slide, please. 
finally, this is just a bit of information around some upcoming work that the Obesity Institute is going to be doing around obesity and disordered eating. This is still work in progress, but if anybody is kind of interested in this sort of area and wants to learn a little bit more, there's a VR code there, QR code and a, a Twitter handle or X handle, as it called now, um, that people can have a look on. And then final slide, please. Uh, this is our next seminar session, which is going to be run by Dr. Duncan Radley on Wednesday, 31st of January 2024. So we hope to see some of you there. And just finally, then from me, thank you for everyone uh, who came today. And a particular thank you to Professor Emma Boyland for your time and that, um, that fantastic session. So thank you very much. Thank you.